It's not uh, people who are of Native American ancestry or even African American ancestry who are in the middle of this whole ginseng thing. We're, we're just, you know, we're not part of it by and large. My name is Victoria Persinger Ferguson. I'm an enrolled member of the Monacan Indian Nation of Virginia. I have been fortunate enough to spend 25, almost 30 years protecting and preserving the culture and history of indigenous people of Virginia. Right now we're in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, I was raised in West Virginia because my family moved to West Virginia in the 1920s and began working in the coal mines. It wasn't like we were the only people there who were, who were indigenous. But I can say my father was one of the few who took it to a very serious level. You see, in 1924, the state of Virginia would pass laws that would re-enumerate Virginia Indians unless they were living on a reservation. And so Native people were not legally allowed to say that they were Native. My father, I remember growing up, would say to me, when you go out into the street, people are not going to call you an Indian, but I need to know that I need you to know that you're an Indian. I moved back into this region, and it was almost the same time that the, the tribe was pulling itself back together. The Monicans are a group of people who were farmers. We raised predominantly corn and beans, but also squash and pumpkins. Almost every family had a rudimentary knowledge of various medicines, medicinal plants and herbs and things like that, and you use them on a daily basis. I can say as far as ginseng is concerned, the Europeans really make it a commodity. But the bottom line of that is within native ways of doing things, you never strip the land. You just don't do it. I'm not saying that there aren't native people who don't hunt ginseng and sell it, but a lot of the people that I do know and I've talked to, they're not hunting it because of, of it being a commodity or because they think it's going to cure cancer or baldness or, or whatever, you know, that, that mythical factor that we may try to, to put into it. I used to work with one of our tribal elders named Miss Birdie, and uh, she showed me the ginseng. Uh, one time she found some ginseng, and uh, she cautioned me. She said, you know, we need to wait until the seeds come on and, and they're ready to seed themselves before we would pull the roots of these plants. And then we kept watching and we went back and eventually we left the plant, but we did take the seeds so that we could spread the seeds. We could propagate these plants elsewhere. And it was a very important lesson because it taught me how important it was that women were propagating a lot of these plants in order to keep these plants growing or to move them from place to place. As a mother, when I would take my kids out, I taught them the rule of thumb as to find three plants and then you could take one, and but you couldn't take all three. And they would look at me and they'd say, well, why is that? And I'd say, well, because think about, you want to leave a mommy and a daddy so there'll be more plants when you come back next year. So if we could encourage people to learn that there's more medicines out there than ginseng that they could use and maybe start using those medicines, we would relax the amount of pressure we're putting on the forest. And, but the, the thing about it is if we introduce people to other alternatives, will the other alternatives become the new ginseng where, where those things are pillaged and raped and plundered to almost non-existence?